I want to ask all of you, whether you're here or you're at home, if you have a Bible, to grab it, turn to Matthew 27. Uh, I love seeing the community that's represented here, people chatting and visiting and laughing and harassing each other. And for those of you online, I want to encourage you to engage with one another. Um, just comment, let people know you're here, and, and just have that little sense of community online as well. As you're turning to Matthew 27, I have one final announcement that I want to make you all aware of. So next weekend, Denise and I are doing something that we haven't done yet. We are taking the weekend off together, which we're very excited. Yeah, yep. Thanks for not applauding and being so excited that we're not going to be here. I appreciate it. No, it was a good thing that you didn't applaud. I like it. You fought the urge to be excited that we will be gone, and I appreciate that. Um, but anyway, so we're going to be gone, but I'm very excited to, to let you know that we're going to have a special guest speaker. Some of you might recognize this name, but Pastor Mike from our Forest Lake campus is going to be coming to share at our campus. And I believe this is the first time in all my years that this has happened, that it's just worked out where I'm actually going to be gone on a weekend and he's available. So uh, many of you know him, many of you have no idea who he is, some of you have heard of him but never heard him speak. And so again, I want to invite you to to come next weekend and just enjoy uh, hearing from Pastor Mike. He is um, he's very excited to get to come over and share with you guys and, and be at this campus and just kind of see what's happening. So if you'd do me a favor, um, don't get me fired. That would be awesome. I would appreciate, appreciate that very much. I can just see half of you coming in dressed weird or stumbling, bringing a 12-pack of, of Mountain Dew with you going to be a good weekend. Matthew chapter 27, starting in verse 38. You guys, I want to acknowledge something, that the, the last um, bunch of messages that we've had here, I think they've been heavy, actually going back over the last two, three months, that they've been just kind of weight, weighty messages. Uh, I think that it, they've just been very real, kind of in your face, and, and I think it's because of what we're reading in the scriptures. It's so important, I think, that we take time in these verses and that we take them seriously. I love to have fun. I love to joke around. I love to have fun illustrations and stuff like that. But to be honest with you, these verses that we read, I, I just, it's not like joke around kind of stuff. Because this is, these verses where we're talking about Jesus' arrest, everything he endured on his way to the cross, being nailed to the cross, being crucified, dying, being buried, and then being raised to life again. These things, these verses, this scripture, this is foundational to our Christian faith. And I honestly believe this. I believe that in our country, the, the United States, where, where there is no shortage of information. Anybody ever get tired of all the information that is constantly coming at us? There's no shortage of information, but I would say this, that I think there's a shortage of biblical understanding, even with our foundational pieces like the crucifixion, understanding the crucifixion of Jesus. Yet this is the foundational piece of our faith. This is the gospel that saves us right here. This bit of verses, these couple chapters, this is the gospel. This is the good news. Yet I would challenge us to ask how many of us really understand it. How many of us could really explain it to somebody else in its simplest form? There's a, there's a statement that I've come to really love, and, and I don't know, made it a few, few weeks ago or a month ago now. But it's this statement, that the single greatest and most important message that ever has been or ever will be is the gospel of Jesus. And I want to say it again. The single greatest and most important message that ever has been or ever will be is the gospel, the good news of Jesus. And here's why. Because this gospel, this message, what we're focusing on right now, this is the only thing that saves us. This is it. It's the only thing that saves us that affects our eternity. That's it. The Bible is so clear about that. It is only Jesus that gives us eternal life. That's it. And that's why I believe it's so important that we, when we read these scriptures, we take time, we focus on them, and church, that we understand them. 
Because truly, if we believe, how many of you, let me ask you this. How many of you would say, I believe that, that statement, that the single greatest message is the gospel of Jesus? You guys believe that today? Yeah, a lot of us do. A lot of us do. Some of us aren't sure, and some of us really just don't like raising our hands in church. It doesn't matter how many times Bill asks. It doesn't matter what. Like, does anybody want cake? Yeah, look at you guys. You're lying because half of you want cake. For Me and Alice are the only ones that want cake. But many of us, we would say, yeah, I'm a Christian, and yes, I absolutely believe that statement is the most powerful and most important statement. The most important message is the gospel of Jesus. So now I want to ask you a question. I'm going to probably step on toes and challenge us a little bit. So if we were to say that, yes, I do believe that the gospel is the single greatest and most important message that has ever existed, how many of us, and I don't want you to respond to this, but how many of us can look inside and look at our lives and say, and my life reflects it? And when I ask that question, I'm not talking about your lifestyle. I'm not talking about, does your life reflect Christianity? That's not what I'm asking. What I'm asking is, if you truly believe that the gospel is the most important message, my question is, does your life reflect that in the way where you're saying yes, and I'm willing to do whatever God asks me to do to advance that message? And I think if we're honest, not just in our church, but in the church as a whole, listen to me, I think if we're honest, what we're going to find is the answer is no. That my life really doesn't reflect that kind of priority on the gospel message, on advancing the gospel. Again, the gospel is the only thing that can save somebody's soul. It's it. And many of us say we believe it, but do nothing to advance it. And and hear me clearly, I'm not saying that because I want you all to feel bad, okay? Really, that's not the goal. My goal is that we would, we would be honest with ourselves and say, yeah, I do believe it. Yes, I do want to advance it. That's the goal. It's just kind of identifying, hey, where are we at today, and what are we going to do moving forward? And today, that's, that's one of the things that I want to challenge us with, is to consider our part in advancing the gospel. So kind of be thinking of that as we look at these verses. So let's continue in Matthew chapter 27, starting in verse 38. For those of you visiting, again, just so you know, we've been in the book of Matthew for two and a half years now. And and it's already August. There's a good chance we're going to make three. Maybe we should set a goal to end. End the series. No, we shouldn't. Yep. All right, so verse 38. Let's get into Matthew chapter 27. The Bible says this, and here's where we're at in the story, just in case you don't know. Jesus was arrested. Jesus is brought to the the high priest's house where this so-called trial takes place. Then he's brought to Pilate because only Rome, only Pilate has the power to say, yes, you can crucify him. He's then brutally uh, beaten and whipped and all this stuff happens. He's brought the cross to Golgotha, and now where we find this is he's up on the cross here. So here's what the Bible says. Two rebels were crucified with him. One on his right and one on his left. I want to stop there because I want you to understand something about this. Again, I I have this statement, and I include myself in this, that I believe many of us Americans are, are really pretty biblically illiterate. That we really don't have these foundational understandings when it comes to our faith. And, and I think it's a serious problem. I think that we, we, need to, we need to try and understand it. So here's what I want you to do in a little effort with this, is I want you to turn in your Bibles to Isaiah chapter 53. Because one of the things that I believe we do today is this, is we take the Old Testament and the New Testament, we see the word new, so we dismiss the old, right? Get a new truck, sell the old truck. That's kind of what we do. And we can't do that in our faith. Because the Old and the New Testament, church, it's, it's one You read the Old Testament, and from the beginning, from Genesis, it's all about God's plan for salvation. That's over and over and over again throughout all of the stuff that we read. It's God's plan of redemption, of bringing us back together with Him. That's what it's all about. And so I want to give you a little insight into this. Once again, we're looking at Old Testament prophecy that has to do with this New Testament uh, situation, what's happening. So in Isaiah chapter 53, verse 12... This is, this is prophetic of Jesus and of the crucifixion. 
He says, therefore, I will give him a portion among the great, and he will divide the spoils with the strong. Because he poured out his life unto death, this is Jesus, pours out his life unto death, and was numbered with the transgressors. He was put with the sinful people. He was put with the criminals. Jesus hanging on the cross next to two criminals. Jesus being completely innocent, them being completely guilty. It says, for he bore the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. He bears our sin and he intercedes. He speaks on our behalf. That's everything Jesus is doing is for us and on our behalf. Go back to the book of Matthew now, verse 39. We're going to try and cruise through this a little bit. The Bible says, Those who passed by hurled insults at him, shaking their heads and saying, You are going to destroy the temple and build it in three days? Save yourself. And what they're doing here is they're actually repeating back something that they heard Jesus say earlier on. Jesus makes a statement about the temple being destroyed but being rebuilt in three days. How many of you know what temple he was talking about? He's talking about himself, right? That's what Jesus was talking about. But what all the other people, what they heard in misunderstanding is thinking that Jesus is talking about the physical temple built in Jerusalem. And so they're walking along, hurling these insults at him. But here's another question for you. How high up was Jesus hanging on the cross? Anybody know? Not very high. See, some of us have this picture of Jesus hanging on the cross where it's like he's 500 yards off on a hill. There's three crosses, and it's like you can, yeah, I th- no, no, I think that's Jesus in the middle there. And that, that's kind of the mentality we have. But here's what the Bible tells us. The Bible, Bible tells us that people were able to walk right by, first of all, and that they were able to use a hyssop branch to bring a sponge up to his mouth. A hyssop branch is usually three to four feet long. So that means if they're standing on the ground, he's up on a cross and, and with three or four feet, that means his feet are somewhere around here, aren't they? Right at eye level. And now I want you to have the picture of what it is that they see as they walk by. Because again, this is the gospel. This is foundational to the Christian faith that many of us don't really get. Jesus is hanging on the cross. He's at eye level. And we've got to understand what he's going through. Remember, he's fully human, isn't he? He's completely human, and he's on the cross, and the Bible makes this so clear. He's naked. You see, we, all, we have all of these images in our head of the pictures and the statues, and we got to remember this. He's hanging on the cross naked. He's hanging on the cross with his, his bones are pulled. They're out of joint, the Bible tells us in Psalm 22. His bones are revealed. That's how aggressively, how horrifically he's been beat. His bones are revealed. Listen to me. Don't get distracted by anything. Listen to me. His bones are revealed. This is where Jesus is at, and he's hanging on the cross, still alive, still conscious, and people are walking by, and as they walk by, they're hurling insults at him. Oh, oh so you're going you're gonna to destroy the temple, but you can't, even, you can't even save yourself. This is the kind of stuff that they're, they're hurling at him. Psalm 22, I referenced it. I want you guys to write that down. Make a note somewhere. Punch it in your phone. But, but seriously, write this stuff down because I want you to go read Psalm 22 this week because it explains the crucifixion to us in great detail. Psalm 22, jot that down. Those of you at home, jot that down. It, it kind of paints a more colored in picture. And this week when you're reading your Bibles, go read that. And it will show you Old Testament ties right in with New Testament. So let's keep going in Matthew chapter 27. We're going to read the rest of verse 40. You guys still with me today? Yeah. A few of you. Cool. Because it's this, come down from the cross. Now remember, they're walking by hurling these insults at him. Come down from the cross if you are the son of God. In the same way it says this. In the same way, the chief priests, the teachers of the law, and the elders mocked him. They say, he saved others, they said, but he can't save himself. He says, come down from the cross if you are the Son of God. He saved others, but he can't save himself. Like, like he's not able to, like he doesn't have the power to do this. And here's what I want you to see. Turn back in your Bibles to Matthew 26. Because I want to make sure that you all understand something here. I want to make sure that you all get that Jesus was not forced to go to the cross. 
You see, so many of us have this idea that Jesus is in the Garden of Gethsemane and all these soldiers come out. Well, Jesus didn't have a choice, right? Jesus had to. He had to go because they were out there to arrest him. And, and, and what else could he do? And what I want you to see is this. Jesus has all the power he needs to not be arrested that day. Jesus is not hanging on the cross mutilated like he is because he doesn't have the power to defend himself. We, you see, we got to understand this, church. we got to understand because people need to know the truth of the gospel. Some of you here today, you need to understand the truth of the gospel. It's not that Jesus is weak and didn't have a choice. Jesus is hanging on the cross, and I want you to hear this clearly today. Jesus is hanging on the cross, I believe, for two very clear reasons. The first is this, because there was nothing more important to Jesus than doing what his father asked him to do. The Bible's clear about that. Over and over again, Jesus says, I do only what my father asked me to do. In the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus says, Father, if this cup can pass from me, if I don't have to go through with this, that's what I would like. That's what Jesus asks in the Garden of Gethsemane. But he says this, yet not my will, but your will be done. Jesus is on the cross because this is God's plan for redemption for you and I so that we can be reconciled for him. What's God's motivated motivation for doing that? Listen to me. It's love. You see, we got to understand that. Jesus is on the cross because God loves us that much. He's not there because a bunch of soldiers arrested him. And I want you to hear this in Matthew chapter 26, verse 52. This is in the Garden of Gethsemane. The soldiers have come out, and Peter responds in, in the way Peter responds to things, and he cuts off one of the soldiers' ears. And here's Jesus' response to Peter. He says, put your sword back in its place, Jesus said to him. For all who draw the sword will die by the sword. Now this is the important one. This is the one you want to underline in your Bibles. Verse 53 says, do you think that I cannot call on my father? Now I want you to pause right there and understand this. His dad's kind of a big deal, isn't he? Do right? you understand who we're talking about here? He's talking to God. And what I know of God is he created everything. He's all powerful. He's, he's everywhere. He's all knowing. This is God. He says, do you think that I cannot call on my father and he will at once put at my disposal more than 12 legions of angels, thousands of angels? He says, but how then would the scripture be fulfilled that say it must happen this way? He's all powerful. And, and what they're mocking him, they're saying this, you, you who are the son of God, save yourself if you can do that. He's all powerful. Of course he can, but he chooses not to. Why? Because God loves us, us enough to send his son so that we can spend eternity with him. You all know that's the gospel? That's the gospel. If you don't understand that principle, I can't challenge you enough and encourage you enough to do whatever you have to to understand it because that's the gospel that we need to be presenting to people. Amen? Amen. Let's continue on reading in Matthew chapter 27. We're going to read the second half of verse 42. Continuing with this mocking as he's hanging on the cross, they say this, he's the king of Israel. Let him come down from the cross and we will believe in him. He trusts in God. Let God rescue him if he wants him. For he said, I am the son of God. And in the same way, the rebels who were crucified with him also heaped insults on him. Here's what sticks out to me is that statement. Let him come down from the cross and we will believe in him. Now, I'm not going to ask anybody to raise their hands here, but, but I want you to be honest with yourselves. And if you've tuned out, can I ask you to tune back in for a minute? Because I, I, want you, I want you to seriously ask yourself this. Have you made those statements like that? Where you've said, God, if you do this, then I will believe in you. God, if you heal them, then I will believe in you. God, if you make my life easier, then I will believe in you. God, if I don't get caught driving home tonight, <laughs> now I know you guys a little better because you knew what I was talking about. Then I will believe in you. But do you understand what I'm saying, though? It's like we, we put this out there. My faith in you, God, is going to be based on my situation. My faith in you, God, is going to be based on my circumstances. And maybe this hasn't been you, but do you know people that, that kind of have this mindset? 
This fair weather faith where it's like, God, you give me what I want and then I will believe in you. Because my, your love for me, God, is based on my circumstances. That's what I think. I want to share with you a, a statement I heard. I listen to all different kinds of messages. You know, I, I, I'll listen to Pastor Mike's messages. Uh, I'll listen to Jason Carlson's messages. I, I listen to some Furtick stuff and some T.D. Jakes, different people. And, and one of the people I tune into periodically is Eagle Brook. And there's a young man there that preaches. His name is Ryan Leak. And, and I like listen to Ryan. I think he's a good preacher. He's an he's a engaging communicator. I like listening to him. But in one of his messages a few months ago, he made a statement that has really stuck with me. And it had to do with going through difficult times. And the statement that he made, it, it fits perfectly right here. But it goes something like this. That God's love is not revealed to us based on our circumstances. And some of us look at it that way. God's love for me is not revealed to me based on my situation. But yet some of us look at it that way. Like when I'm walking through a hard time... See, God doesn't love me. When my life is good, when all the ducks are in a row, when, when, when things are going as planned, then it's like, I'm blessed by God. You know what I mean? Anybody ever, don't raise your hands anymore, because I'm going to ask you, but I don't want to know really the truth, and I don't want you to lie, so let's just not raise hands. But have you ever felt that way, where you're just like, yes, you know, business is good, and marriage is good, and, and kids, well... Who cares? And, and then you move on, you know? And it's like, like, I'm blessed, you know? I found favor with God. You know what I'm talking about? It, just, just say yes, you know what I'm talking about. Okay. But here's what I want to tell you is this, is that those two things, that, that's, not a, that's not the right way to look at God or our faith, for that matter. God's love for us is not revealed in our circumstances. Because here's, here's why I kind of put this together scripturally. You guys, you, maybe some of you have heard of the Apostle Paul in the Bible. He, he wrote a lot of the New Testament letters in the Bible. And he was used by God in an amazing way. Really, really amazing way. He went from being this persecutor of Christians, having this amazing interaction with Jesus, and, and then being one of the greatest missionaries that have, has ever lived. Uh, uh, an important part in our, in our, our Bibles today, 2,000 years later. Would you say God loved Paul? That's kind of what I'm trying to get to. I think God loved Paul. Would you say that God loved John the Baptist? I think so. I mean, John the Baptist was a good egg. He, he did some great stuff. Would you say God loved John the Baptist? Here's the trick question, and I'm letting you know it's a trick question in advance. So I don't know if it still counts as a trick question or not, but it's a trick question. Would you say that God loved Jesus? Yeah. See, it's a trick question, isn't it? Yeah. Of course he did, right? Of course God loved Jesus. But now I want you to look at their lives or what you know of their lives. Because the Apostle Paul said, yes to the Lord, whatever you want to use me for, and look at his life. It wasn't easy. He wasn't walking through a field of daisies. John the Baptist was used by God. Listen to me. I think one of the greatest, actually, Jesus, the, Jesus says of John the Baptist, the greatest ever born of women. But look at John the Baptist. His life wasn't easy. He, his, he got his head cut off. Look at Jesus, the Son of God. His life wasn't easy. Look what he had to walk through. You see, when we start association, associating our circumstances and saying, see, my life is hard, my life is easy, and, and we use that as some kind of a litmus test as to God's love for us, do you see how far off and out of base that is? How far off base that is? It's just not real. But yet, that's the message that some of us have heard and we bought into, and it's not scriptural. Nowhere does it say following God means easy. And I go back to this statement that Ryan made. God's love is not revealed to us in our circumstances. Listen to me closely now. God's love is revealed to us on the cross. Do you hear that? It's not our circumstances. It's the cross. And church, I come back to this original statement. The single greatest and most important message that has ever been or ever will be is the gospel of Jesus. It's the cross. It's the message of the cross. Because it all leads to salvation. The message of the cross, Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection, it is the only thing that can save us. That is it. 
The amount of money we have, how nice of a person we are, there's nothing else that exists that can save us. Yet as we look at it as Christians, what are we doing to advance that message? And I think that that's challenging. And today what I want to do is this, real quickly. I want to close by doing two things. Number one, I want to ask you that are here to consider your salvation. To consider your faith. What do you think of all of this stuff that I've been ranting about? What do you think of the gospel? What do you believe when it comes to Jesus and his death, his burial, and his resurrection? What do you believe? I want you to consider that today as I, as I continue on in this message. But the other thing I want to do is this. To those of you that would call yourself believers, I've surrendered my life to Jesus, then here's what I want to do is challenge you with this. Do you feel equipped to share the gospel? Do you share the gospel? Not, not, and I want you to understand, I'm not saying do you beat people over the head with the Bible. Do you go out and tell them everything they're doing is wrong, the lifestyle you're living is not right, and God hates you, and that's not what I'm talking about. That's what some of us associate preaching the gospel with. If that's you, would you please stop doing that? <laughs> <laughs> and some of us, that's why we don't want anything to do with it, is because that's the message we've heard. I'm going to tell you, that's not the gospel of Jesus. The gospel is his death, burial, and resurrection because of love. Today what I want to do is equip us a little bit. I, I like to work on cars. I, I really do. I like to learn things. I like to get greasy. Anybody else like to get greasy? Just me and Jason and Lori. That's awesome. I like to get greasy, but sometimes I want to go work on the car. And I get excited about working on the car. I get the parts to work on the car. I'll even clean the garage a little bit so that the car can actually get in the garage so I can work on the car. And then I'll find myself going to work on the car and realize I have no idea what I'm doing. And then I'll just go back in the house and eat another bag of chips. You know, it's like, <laughs> I'm not going to do it. And the reason I end up not doing it is because I don't feel equipped. I'm not sure what I'm doing. And for some of us, we do believe in the gospel. And we do want to share the gospel, but we feel ill-equipped. Ill and so what I want to do... As some of you contemplate your salvation, others of you, I would like to give you tools to very plainly and scripturally share the gospel with somebody today. That's what I want to equip you with. That's why I'm saying, if you have a notebook, pull that out right now. If you have a pen, grab a communication card in front of you and jot these down. If you happen to have a phone, and I know a couple of you in the room do, type this into your notes. Because church, listen to me, the gospel is the most important thing. And when we feel equipped to share it, I believe we're going to be much more apt to do it. I want to share with you something many of you will be familiar with, and that's this Romans Road that many of you have heard of. It's a very simple, succinct way to share the gospel. But again, I, and I know for some of you this is really stretching you, we're Christians. We should care about sharing the gospel. We should care about that more than anything else. And I know that challenges some of you, but it's the truth. Because it is the most important message that exists. How do we share the gospel? Step one is this. The verse, Romans chapter 3, verse 23. Jot that down. Just write down Romans 3, 23. And here's what it says. It says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And my favorite word in all of that is the word all. You see, we have to understand that for all of us fall short of the glory of God. Every one of us needs Jesus. Some of us, we look at the church and we think they don't because they're all perfect. I'm going to say this. Religious people like to pretend to be perfect. But we all need Jesus. For those of you in the room, I want you to know that every one of us needs Jesus. Maybe your life is, is, is in just complete shambles right now. Maybe you're struggling in a way you've never struggled before. I want you to know every one of us has been there in some way, shape, or form because every one of us falls short. Every one of us has sin in our life. Every one of us need Jesus. The Bible says this, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. The second verse, part two of the Romans road is this. Write this down. Romans chapter six, verse 23. And I have this little A, the letter A after it because we're going to just look at the first half and then we'll look at the second half. 
Here's what it says. Romans 6.23a, it says this. And the wages of sin is death. I want you to understand this. Part 1 says, for all have sinned. And because of that sin, what we deserve is eternal death, spiritual death, separation from God. You see, the Bible talks clearly about heaven and hell. These places are real. As much as we don't like how that feels, it's real. And because of our sin, what we deserve is this spiritual death. The wages of sin is death. Now listen, the third step is this. This is Romans 6.23b, okay? The second half of this verse. Romans 6.23b, it says this, but, and I thought of this first service, and and I said it, and I shouldn't have, but I'm going to say it again. I like God's butt. Do you know what I mean? (laughs) Because that's what I see right here. The wages of sin is death, but, and this is God's butt, and it's a nice butt, but, listen to me, the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus. And I want you to hear this so clearly. Salvation is a gift. Some of us have grown up in homes and spent a large, many, many years in homes or in churches where what we've been taught is you have to perform in order to get into heaven. You have to do enough stuff in order to get into heaven. You have to do your checklist of things. Some of us, even the homes we've grown up in, we've grown up in homes that have been performance-based. We've been held to a very high standard. And I don't think it's bad to be held to a high standard as a person. Where I do see there being a problem, and don't get distracted, where I do see there being a problem is where we get, we, we translate that over into our spirituality, where then we think, okay, now i got to live up to this standard in order to get into heaven. And it's just not true. The Bible is so clear about it, and it emphasizes it over and over again. Paul spent the majority of his life battling religious people. Jesus would get the most upset. He wasn't upset with sinful people. Listen to this. Jesus didn't get mad at the prostitute, the tax collector, the homosexual. Jesus didn't get mad at them. Jesus loved them and brought a message to them, a message of salvation. Do you know who Jesus got upset with? The religious people. The people who who tried to lord this religious checklist of things over others. That's who he got upset with. You see, salvation is a gift from God. And it is only found in Christ Jesus. I want you to write down this verse, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 and 9. Jot that down. Go read that this week. Because if you're ever sharing this with somebody, Ephesians 2, 8, 9 is is a wonderful scripture to share with people, especially people who think they have to earn their way into heaven. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9 says this, For it is by grace that you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves. Listen, again, it says it is a gift of God, not by works, so that you can boast. You know what a lot of us like to do? A lot of us like to boast about our achievements, don't we? I'm not saying it's bad. But the one thing we will never be able to boast about is our salvation. Because it's not something that can be earned. All fall short of the glory of God, step one. The first piece that some of you here need to understand is you're not alone. We all do. The wages of that sin is eternal separation from God. But God offers us a gift, and that gift is salvation. The fourth step is this. Romans chapter 5, verse 8. Jot that down, Romans 5, 8. You guys don't, don't stop writing down. Don't get, don't get tired of it. Write it down, Romans 5, 8. It says this, listen to this. One of my favorite top five verses I bet now is this. It says, but God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. You see, here's why this is so important. is because in the world we live, love has taken on so many different definitions, hasn't it? 
love many of us, and don't raise your hand, but, but I wonder how many in the room have experienced love in an unhealthy, ungodly way. Love with a strings attached love. Maybe from a dad to a son saying, son, I love you so much if you perform high enough. A mom to a daughter. Maybe even again in the church setting, God loves you if you live up to this standard. Because if you don't, he's really mad at you. Some of us on personal relationships, we've experienced the unhealthy love. Maybe the love you've experienced is one of manipulation. Where you've had to be good enough and then your spouse loves you. If you measure up, then your parents or your kids love you. Your friends accept you. And see, that, though, that's just not a healthy picture of love. Maybe some of us have experienced love with empty words. You all know what I'm talking about when I say that? Empty words. Somebody that says, I love you, but as you really step back and look at their actions, there's nothing that would show you that love. You all know what I mean today? It's empty words. And this is why this verse takes on such meaning for me personally. Romans 5.8, it says, God demonstrates his love. And it's so important that we understand that. God doesn't just say, I love you in a letter. He demonstrates his love. And then it goes on and says this, while we were still sinners. You know, there's so many people that have this idea that they have to get all of their stuff together before they go to church. Anybody know anybody like that? It's like, yeah, I'd, I'd come, but first I got to, you know, I have a drinking problem, so I'm going to get that taken care of first, or, you know, I'm, I, this is going on, this is my lifestyle, I got I to gotta correct all of this stuff, and then I think maybe I'll go to church and, and consider, you know, God in my faith. We have this idea that we got to fix it all first, and that's why this verse is so powerful, and I'm going to tell you, some of you today, you need to hear this, and some of the people in your lives need to hear you share this with them. That while we were still sinners, God sent his son to die for us. All of our imperfections, all of our struggles, knowing every bit of them, he sends his son to die for us. That's the truth of the scriptures. No strings attached love. No empty words love. This is demonstrated genuine love. And, and people need to know that. John 3.16. Maybe, maybe you've heard this verse before. But John 3.16, it says this. For God so loved the world that he sent his one and only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God so loved that's what people need to hear today. All the division, all of the anger, all of the hatred. Listen to me. The people know good enough everything the church doesn't like. Don't you think? I mean, I think we've made that more than clear. You know what people need to know? And some of you need to know this today. Whatever you brought into this room, whatever you did last night, whatever even this morning entailed, I'm going to tell you this. God loves you. Jesus goes to the cross because God loves you. That's how much he loves you. And we need to remember that. And listen, we need to share that with people. The fifth step, the final step of this Romans road is this. It's Romans chapter 10, verse 13. Write that down, Romans 10, 13. And I want to read to you, I'm going to start reading in verse 9, but that verse 13 is, that's the scripture you want to share with people. It says this, starting in verse 9, if you declare with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. I got a question for you before I keep reading. When was the last time, or have you ever said that from your mouth? If you're here and you're a Christian, have you ever spoken from your mouth, not because it was projected on the wall or written in a hymnal? Anybody know what a hymnal is in the room today? Yep, I grew up with hymnals, man. I had that whole thing memorized. I knew which service we were doing. Yep, I got it. It's not written in a hymnal. It's not on a piece of paper saying, hey, repeat after me. But have you ever, from your heart, your words, your voice to him, said, you are my Lord? That's a powerful thing to say, isn't it? 
Whether it be in church during our times of worship or when you're driving in your truck or, or in your car, just to say from your mouth to his, you are my Lord. Jesus, you are my King. You are my Savior. You are my Master. You are the Messiah. Jesus, I love you. Have you ever said those words? Because I'm going to tell you this. When we talk about our praise being a weapon... To speak those things out, to say that loud and proud, bold, that's something. To speak the words. Romans chapter 5, verse 10 says, says, it is with your heart that you believe and are justified, and it is with your mouth that you profess your faith and are saved. As scripture says, anyone who believes in him will never be put to shame. That's powerful. I hope you have that underlined. For there is no difference between Jew and Gentile. The same Lord is Lord of all and richly blesses all who call on him. Those words all are so stinking important. You see, you got to understand the Jew and the Gentile in Paul's time when he's writing this, they battled each other. There was a dislike for one another, like, like crazy dislike. Didn't eat together, just didn't want anything to do with each other. And so what Paul's statement here, this carries more weight than many of us imagine. For all he's saying. So for you and I today, this is what we got to remember. This message, this is for the rich and the poor. It doesn't matter the color. It doesn't matter the language. It doesn't matter which side of the tracks you grew up on. Who remembers when side of the tracks mattered? Which edge of town, which, which side of 35 you lived on, which side of 94 you were on? It doesn't matter. And for some of us, that's hard to imagine, isn't it? This idea that... For all who call. Because this is what it says. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Amen? Amen? That's beautiful. That's hard for some of us to grab onto. Because here's the picture I want you to have in your head, your head right now. The person that you absolutely cannot stand the most on this planet. Some of you are picturing people. Some of you are thinking about me right now because you're thinking, I'm hungry. <laughs> but the, the person that you cannot stand the most in life, I'm just going to give you a second to think through because some of you got a list. I'm going to let you get them all in your head right now. Here's what I want you to understand is this. When I hear this scripture, here's what I know to be true. That if that person puts their faith in Jesus, guess what? You're going to get to heaven and you're going to look and you're going to look at that person and you're going to say, what are you doing here? You know? For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. And then that person's going to look back at you, and they're going to say, what are you doing here? And you see, that's because we don't know the full extent of God's grace and God's mercy. We can't imagine. But here's what we know to be true from the Bible. Is that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. And church, that's the gospel. That's what people need to know. That's what some of you here today need to know. Some of you don't feel good enough. I'm going to tell you this. It's not about you. All you got to do is believe. It's not about what you know, how many Bible verses you have memorized. It's not about your church attendance, how good you can sing, whether or not you play on a worship team. It's not about any of that stuff. It's not about how often you swear. It's not about what you watch on your computer. It's, here's the deal. When it comes to just salvation, listen to me, it's not about you or what you do or don't do. It's about what you believe and if you believe in what he's already done. That's the gospel. We can't attach anything to it. We can't say you're only saved if you fix this. We can't say you're only going to heaven if you stop doing this. It's not about that. It is simply about your faith and do you believe in Jesus. That's it. Now church, some of you here today this is speaking to you because you haven't surrendered your life to Jesus. And if you haven't, then I cannot encourage you enough to consider doing that. To admit and say, I, I'm a sinner. I need you. To believe, to just simply say, I believe that, that you died for my sins. I believe that you were buried and that you rose again to confess him 
as your Savior. And some of you, you believe this message is the most important. Then I want you to take those five steps. Write them down. Memorize them. And walk people through them when you have those open door opportunities. Stop telling people everything they're doing wrong. Tell people that God loves them so much that he sent his son to die for them and that they can have everlasting life simply through believing in them. Amen.